Hello and welcome to our iconographer's monthly meeting. This time we are supposed to speak about symbolism of color. Well, that's what I promised, that's what I announced as the topic. And I was thinking it was a great idea. And I even made this quiz, but I was wrong. Because the very substance of color for our ancestors was very different from what it is for us. It was much less concrete than it is for us. Lately, I saw several books about color in certain periods of human history, and they all say how relative are the names of the color or the name of the color in different periods. From Cinino Cinini, we can get specific artistic titles of colors, which sound like terms. Or speaking about our days. In Russian, the process of highlighting the face or adding light to skin tone, we call or we use the word, the verb, deriving from ochre. So we actually, what we do, we are ochring the face. So that's how it is, and like how you find symbolism in a situation when everything has very different names. So like symbol of the color, which has no particular stable title. That's the problem. And in Italy, of course, they have their own terms, also related to the areas that pigments were excavated or produced or other things. Or now I'm going to share a picture and you will know why I'm doing it. Because if we take Bible and Apocalypse, we read the description of the New Jerusalem. And it sounds like this. The city shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. Jewel like a jasper, clear as crystal. What I'm showing you on the screen is jasper, but who can say it was exactly this color? Who can say it was exactly even this stone because there are lots of different investigations, and some of them would say it means quartz with shades of green, blue, and red. Literal jasper is not clear. In Russian, theologians sometimes translate this word, this stone, as amber. So the heavenly Jerusalem made of amber. Another version says its finest form of diamond one of the clearest luster and sets forth Christ's character, which endured as well his character, which is so desirable. And yet another version says that Jasper is lapis lazuli. So which one we are supposed to take as the model and to think of and to use a symbol, etc., etc. We can say John is struggling to explain what he sees in terms others can understand, using most relevant images he can think of. But reading these things, we have a choice. Okay. Uh, or if somebody's having problems with sound, I'm really sorry. Well, I will continue because my microphone indicator shows everything's working well. So I just, I move on, sorry. So about the Jasper, we have a choice. We can get obsessed to identify the very precise name of the stone, the very best stone of this title, which was considered at the time. And then, and then what? So if we find the most concrete stone we find in the Bible, what do we do with it? We use this color or we tell everybody, okay, we finally found the meaning of the color can be used for garment of Jesus as well as heavenly Jerusalem picture. Not sure, because for us as visuals, any color is a possibility to, to analyze the way we perceive it. 
to analyze how it functions with the neighbors, with our environment, with the context, with everything. So it's not how you name it, but how it works. And now I'm thinking to slowly move to the visual kingdom, but on the way there, I want to say a word about symbolism of color. It does exist, but it's not what we think it is. I guess the main problem with symbolism is that we have a temptation to immediately interpret it in words. Like when we see a martyr in red garments, we say, we know why this person is in red. He or she was a martyr. So we see red as symbol of resurrection, life, fire, and hundreds of other meanings. But if you follow this road further, we'll have to say that any icon or like real traditional icon is a kind of map of symbolic countries where this part will symbolize that, this part of the icon will symbolize this, and altogether they create a meaningful puzzle where the role of an artist is to encrypt. And our role as the beholders is to decrypt the message. So uh, for Kelly, I can say, oh, Kelly can hear me. So as in the internet, in early times, we used modem. You probably remember modulation, demodulation. And the problem is that all this stuff is functioning in the same way. So artists is considered someone who is encrypting or like putting symbols on the board, incorporating symbols in the image. So that afterwards, someone who is looking at them is decrypting, is reading them, is like getting what the artist had encryption and decryption, like a spy who is receiving some specific message from the center has to decrypt it. So that's what the beholder is supposed to do if you follow the logic of symbolism of color in iconography. But I'm not sure that's what how it was intended originally, because, well, how, how can I be sure? It's a very easy question for me. Because normally, as if you tell, if we talk about the the old world, the ancient world, people were more intermediate than they are, and if they wanted to say something in words, they would, if they were willing to communicate something in I don't Greek language, they would do that. They would con communicate in Aramaic or other languages if that was the case, but. In case with iconography, okay, just a minute. So in case with iconography, we think we, we decide, we consider that iconographers thought this was the best way they could express what they wanted to say. They didn't want to write music because they thought music would bring a different result. They thought the paint is the best vehicle to just deliver what they wanted to say. So they use paint because otherwise we try to imagine an artist trying to kill himself or herself, trying to encrypt the verbal message into the colors so that the beholder would decrypt it, but why becoming an artist? You can simply write these things in words for other people to easily read them. I think for visual people, symbolism of color is realized through interaction with other colors, through its poetic vision, metaphorical understanding, and at the same time as a tool delivering the visual information. Now I will show you how it works in a simplistic and a straight way, but trying to indicate or demonstrate several directions which 
I hope at least maybe a couple of them you wouldn't know before this meeting. I don't know, maybe you do, but I just wanted to list them all together. And I will start sharing my screen again. And we'll move forward to these images because now we are going to see the icons. So if we look at this one, we see first the red color. The artist couldn't make image of Christ red. So he took another path and made a second figure red. But the way this red is positioned and supported by surrounding colors, it's a true poetry because the green and yellow around it are echoing it, are helping to find the rhythm. And the green, which is repeated nearby, is almost exactly the same on top and on the bottom. And if you start analyzing, we'll see that artists wanted to not just please our eye, but to say something. And in this moment, I would suggest that the idea was to make image consist of several parts, each of which was supposed to make a little wow effect all the time. Like for example, we look at this image and we see nowhere anything purple except on the figure of Moses. So it's the only figure of purple, nowhere else is supported. Why is that? And on the opposite side, there is Elijah, which is green and exactly the same green and blue as we see St. John below. Why is that? So there are many things which from decorative point of view are not nice, are not explained logically because they were not supposed to. So these rhythmic structures, this echoing system is meant to communicate as something specific. Like I would say the green garments of two people belonging to the Old Testament and the New Testament would probably mean the specific attitude of the artist to them and maybe to compare their destinies. Why not? So that could be an extra meaning we add to what we see around. Maybe they had something in common. Or in other words, we perceive this message via nonverbal communication. And we are expected to process it non-verbally too because we are not supposed to always explain everything to ourselves. We just see things and we feel them, how they're made. Well, look at this one. I hope it will be always a different image, always calling for some different interpretation like this. We see Jesus in pink. Would you personally dare to paint an icon like that without risk being blamed in a blasphemy. Well, this artist did, but with such a delicacy and care that we can only admire or be envious of how he or she did it. How to paint Jesus in pink garment. <coughs> I would say it's so genius, like the Song of Songs, talking about very controversial and delicate subject in such a noble and virtuous way. Just imagine yourself mixing this pink. I think for me, it probably would take an hour just finding the appropriate shade of it to be able to use it with the image of Christ. But this artist balanced it with almost total darkness of the veil of the Theotokos and reflecting it or extending it on the greenish garment of John the Theologian and making it a more resemblance. So the whole piece, the whole three icons together, they create a poetry where one color supports the other. And we can start saying like, okay, Apostle John was 
I don't know, his figure in the New Testament symbolizes life, revival, apocalypse, etc., etc. But it wouldn't mean anything. The color itself means so much more that any word is not helping. It's just the, it will just destroy the image if we start translating it into words. It's a whole different world. Well, now I suggest for you all to see the four versions of one icon. Oh no, not this moment. Yes, that will be this and next one. Now I show you a wall of architectural gallery. And of course, you, you know the daisy's composition with the image of Christ in the middle. And of course, you will notice that there is John the Baptist lacking. Yes, he's missing. This icon is, I don't know, disappeared somewhere. We don't know. But we can notice how dark is the figure of the mother God. She is almost pure black. She is brownish, but almost pure black compared to all the rest. And see how next to her, and I would say next to John the Baptist, there is this luminosity and decorativeness of figures of the archangels. So they are total opposite of the mother of God. She's flat. They are elaborate. She is dark, they are bright. She has the wholeness and integrity. They all are made of separate details. Interesting. What comes next? Peter and Paul. What about that? Well, they are colorful, but yet they're different from the mother of God and from the angels. They're all colorful, but yet they're much more flat. So their figures are another term of this poetry trying to reveal the color in a different way, in an opposite, opposite, opposite. So they always try to find extreme maximums to show how one person is different from the other. Not because yellow is different from red, but also by the way the artist is treating these colors how the artist is juxtaposing one color to the other. And the figure of Christ in the center, I would say, combines all these features. He has dark garment. He also has this orange stripe, which makes his garment look more decorative. And yet the amount of this decoration is very low. So the artist is writing these icons, is painting them, as a piece of poetry, so our eyes can wander around and always find some resemblance, some rhythms to feel how these things are combined. And I'm going to show the four versions. Four versions of one icon will be willing to ask you which of the four versions you think the original one, because there are three of them I modified in Photoshop, and the fourth is the original. So this, let's say this one is number one, and this is the number two, very different in many aspects. And this would be number three, <coughs> sorry, and this one is number four. So I'm going back now, and I would say this one is number four, this one is number three, number two, and number one. So which of these four <clears throat> you think would be the original one, unmodified, and which of them I have modified <clears throat> to make look, I don't know, different? Any thoughts? I don't know, Joan, Noala, who has the microphone on? I don't know. I would have guessed number three, but it was the original, but... Okay, one, two, guess. three. This is number three, can be the original. Okay, as an option, interesting, all right. How would you, I don't know, support your opinion? <coughs> Why would you say that? All oh, right. I guess because of the red and, um, I don't know, Just it just looks older to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, like looks more authentic for you. Yeah, most authentic yeah. and more old. Okay. Thank you, Noel. Okay, any other thoughts? Deborah? 
Did I see number four? Mm -hmm. Okay, number four. Okay. I, I think that one somehow. All right. Good. All right. Any any more thoughts or more possibilities? I, I would think so, I number, would think that maybe the first one. Um number four. Number the number three, one. Number, number one. Two and number one. Mm -hmm. uh, because it is very um it is muted and the icon itself, just the shape of the board looks like it is rather old. And so I would think that the old in some cases the older that an icon might be, the more uh, the colors would have become more muted. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a great opinion, especially because we know the destiny of icons and they could have survived difficulties and damages. Okay, accepted. Uh, any more thoughts? I know Stephen, no? I would Kelly, agree. With, how are you? Sorry, kick. Stephen, yes. I would have picked the first one as the oldest. Mm -hmm. Okay. It would be Good. interesting to see them all together. <laughs> well, you see, it's more, yes, I, I should have made it, but I it's, probably will make it at the end of the lecture. I think I may add it at the end. Okay. Good. Uh, how are you doing? Would you say something? How is it? no? Okay, so uh, um, oh Kelly, yes, Kelly. Yeah, hi. Sorry, I got the sound back. I'm having problems with my technical thing. Anyways, um, I I kind of like I don't know was the first one the brighter one. This is the one that is number two. Oh, that one. Number okay. three and number four. I like number four. Okay. Okay. So the vote says there are two people for number one, two for number four, and one for the number three. Okay. Good. I'm happy we have so many different opinions <laughs> because that's indeed not really my task. My idea, my purpose is to make everybody think. So how it works here, it does really work in that way. But let me allow allow me to get back to number one and maybe say some words about this one because i can agree with those who would vote for this one but overall if you try to think of colors probably changing but rather damaged than changed so we see scratches we see cracks but overall the very structure very mm, the very color of the paint usually remains, or at least in the situations like that, where the whole surface is quite even. And I would say if we consider that as something given, we see that the face with the hair and the neck is coming forward more than anything else. So we would say that the face and the neck at the central part of the icon are perfectly brought forward by the artist. The artist gave, gave specific accent on them, but compared by the activeness, the face and the rest of the image, you should see it. Now the secondary details we see on this icon look a little too muted to support the face well. So I would say that if even the stones and other details can be slightly more active, create a good ensemble together with this active face. Well, I made the version number two was maybe too much blue. Yes, I see you all agree with it. And as far as we go and see the number three, some people may suggest it's the best one according to how red is presented. But in this case, I suggest thinking whether the red is in good relationship with the face. 
because from what I see, the red is a little too active in balance. And in this case, it's slightly disrupting the attention of the beholder from the face. So the red garment competes with the intensity of the face. So no, that was a modified one as well. So yes, the number four is the most perfect balance, almost perfectly well, in good, at least in good conditions, survived from, I guess it might be 13th century, maybe early 14th. And why would I bring this image, not some other one right now? Because I wanted you to admire, to enjoy, and to study how the characters of different colors interact. Because if you take the red, it's the brightest, but yet not too bright. Like if you compare it with the previous one, it's not that bright and not dark. So it's bright, but late enough to be on a different step, on different level of perception compared to the face. Somehow that's how it works. The brightest color can function perfectly if it doesn't get into um, what's the word? contradiction with the main part, which is the face. And if you start speaking about the blue, it's a beautiful one, especially because it's muted enough. So it's not trying to compete with the red. It's darker than the red, definitely darker. And yet it's slightly lighter than the face and it gives a much more flat and I would say uninformative surface compared to the face. So face more complex and dark. The blue is flat, colored, but not too much. And especially I love the yellowish of the halo and the yellow part of your garments because they start talking to the yellow of your un undergarment, yeah? The garment below this red thing. So there is a very, uh, there are several layers of perception of this image and several characters of colors, each of which has its own destiny and not trying to compete for our attention. And I would say it's a provincial one. So it was made in some village or little town in the north of Russia. And yet see how, how wonderfully this artist has balanced all the colors, all the few colors he or she had available. I think it's St. Barbara, even without gold. So that was just equilibrium, perfect equilibrium of all. Wow, many colors in one inch, because now we're going to have an opposite color. We have only two colors in one inch, that's it. Why is that? Because this artist has a duty, has, I don't know, a commission to depict the life of St. Alexis around the eye. So what he or she does, using only two colors to focus all our attention in the middle, making the skin tone so red, I would say red, because it's red Two good and actually the green artist is giving us symbolism. Well, the green would symbolize, I don't know, life, everything, everything, everything. But first of all, it's a great center of an icon with lots and lots of little details. He juxtaposes the simplistic center to the complexity of the literal sub subjects. I would say. This artist wouldn't dare, wouldn't think of making this simple center if there would be no little subjects around it. It would be boring, but now it's like a very strong central subject with lots and lots of little things. Just a possibility to think how you can manage the color. And here I have connected two photographs together, but you see in the middle, it's not a very good connection. Yeah, it's a line of figures along the altar ups. And I want just 
for you to look at it and think, why would the artist choose this or that? Because in the beginning, we can name them. We see red and green. Then we have green and blue. Then we have yellow and gray, but then we have dark, dark blue and red. So they do resemble each other. There is a bit of connection, especially because they have very similar posture. And yet how each of the color is chosen is not just to please our eye, it's not just to tell us, oh, how nicely he is saying like yellow, red, yellow, red. No, no, no. There is always some irregularity, some oddness, which tells us it's not just to show how nicely they are posing for us, but it's a real event the iconographer wanted to describe. It's a poetry. And here image by George Cordes, I think it may be on canvas or paper, but I just wanted to attract your attention how he combined the green in so many shades to the red of the garment. So we see green border, we see green background, and we even see some brownish green on the scarf or whatever it is, and the, the arms, yes? So it's still green. Five shades of green with one red. Why would he do it? Because he wanted our eyes to stay focused and not to be overwhelmed with different kinds of information. That is enough. Few good words are much better than many, many destructive words. And moving forward, I'm showing again Natalia Rusetska, whom I have been showing a while ago as well. And I just don't say it's an icon, but I wanted to, I don't know, to share this image with you or you to enjoy how this delicacy of black in the bottom, almost black or transparent black, step by step gets into the very specific relationship with yellowishness of heavenly forces on top. So I would say it's, it's a work of an artist because she knows how to delicately merge them, juxtapose them and make them all play, make them all function with noble, I would even say noble expression. And this one, I think was not made by an artist because this person knew how to apply colors on paper, but this artist did not use eyes to create the image. Because if you use eyes, you will be thinking whether the hands have to be so bright in order to complete this thing. Yes, how much more this image needs if it already has this brightest blueness of the background and the whitishness of the dove. Yes, how much more you need? How, why you need to load your track so much to have so many different things on the plate? So when I was showing it in the morning to my Australian group, I was, I suggested just to cover the lower part of the screen. And I think that would work well. Well, I don't say we don't need anything else, but I would say this is too much. And too much because someone just wanted to add bright colors. I like bright colors too, but not too much, not too many of them. Just try to keep some balance. That's it. It's very usual and normal for our time because this kind of pictures, they're printed and produced in millions, pretending to be art, but art is something working visually. It's a poetry working visually, not like that. And another one produced by contemporary iconographers, which I would say even worse, because I didn't know who did this thing without ever, ever looking at it with eyes of an artist. Like why all these lines are struggling with each other? Why all these colors are struggling with each other? Why all these things are torturing me? That's what I don't know. Because this thing was produced by someone who never thought the colors can be a joy and poetry and 
the substance which is supposed to give you, I don't know, life and love, but not like that. Well, here is an old guy or lady who did the same job with a very simplistic way. But there is so much more, I don't know, poetry, delicacy, care in what this person did. Yes, few colors, very simplistic gesture. And you can say, okay, probably it's of center. He or she should probably put it more in center, but we don't know where on the wall it is. Yes, it probably is in such a position in the wall, so it, it fits perfectly. We don't know that. But overall, it, it doesn't have to be, I don't know, having hundreds of colors. It just has to work. And that's what I want to, to tell today. So very few more images. One of them was a photograph I found of famous St. Petersburg photographer, Alexander Petrosyan. If you're not subscribed in YouTube to his page, he's, he's just great. And he's a street photographer, so he was walking, yes? He didn't put this dog here. He was walking by and made a shot. And I wanted to draw your attention to the fact how the blueiness of the sky is resembled in the blueiness of the snow and the yellowishness I don't know, of the sun is completing everything, plus supported by the red of the, ball, of the walls. Just perfect color combination, just, just wonderful. And again, I'm showing you Ratalia Rusetska and one more image and that will be it. So this one is Yerushin, no, this one is made by Natalia Rusetska. I'm sorry, I'm not showing you a better quality photograph. I couldn't find one. But again, I wanted to support my thought of not necessarily using different, many different colors. Here you only have white, two shades of blue, and two shades of green. So you don't need to say much to be understood. You don't need to say, hundreds of words to have your message delivered. And the last one is Yerzy Novosievsky, who died a few years ago being a very old man. I think he was 95 when he died. And I guess he is considered by many iconographers in Poland, in uh, Ukraine, Belarus, in many other countries, Serbia, even Russia, as one of the I don't know, leading avant-garde or contemporary iconographer, but I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that even the brightest colors can be put together and you can find a good friendship for them. You can make a poetry out of most contemporary, I don't know, uh, nuclear space, terrible, wonderful, strange colors, if you are a good artist. So play with colors and see how they can fit together. How can they work with one another? And if you feel they are functioning, you're in the right way. So that's it. That's it for now. That's it for today, because that's how an artist works. I don't say every contemporary icon should look like this, but I'm saying that a real artist is someone who operates the colors. And symbolism of colors is something applied on top by verbals, first of all. That's it. Thank you very much.